If you're able, would you please stand and join me in today's call to worship? We who have risen to embrace this day, we who are weary in body and spirit, we who know the abundance of life, we who are left impoverished by harsh realities, we who are strong in mind and soul, we who are challenged by illnesses and of many kinds. We who have a voice and the strength to use it. We who whisper prayers in our hearts. All our heart is worship the God we love. Come, for you have a place of honor in the heart of God.
God be with you. And also with you. Turn around and bless one another with a lovely smile. Do that. Does he want to go? Does he want to come up here? You come with me, Dad. Oh, there's more coming. They're coming from the nursery. Oh, cool. All right. Yay. And we can have a big kid, too. You can come. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Oh, these summer Sundays. Kids coming and going. Hey, come over closer here so I can talk to you guys. Nicholas, come over here closer. Come on. All right, I'll just sit here on the steps with everybody. How are you this morning? Good. Doing fine. Are you tired from your concert last night? Mm, kind of. Uh, our Sunday school band played over at Wayne, Wayne Stock. what do they call it? Wayne Stock, yeah. Wayne Stock last night, and they did a really good job. Of course, we knew that they would. They were the headliners, you know. <laughs> At least for a bunch of us, they were. <laughs> you know what was interesting? I got to say this real quickly. Well, one of the bands was performing. There was a there was a rainbow that developed over top the stage from where I was sitting. Isn't that cool? I thought that was very cool. Have you ever seen a bird's nest? How many? Have you ever seen a bird's nest? Yeah, you've seen a bird's nest. Did you ever hold one? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, well, bird's nests, you know, what are, what are they for? Huh? For birds, right? But what do birds have them for? Make eggs, put their eggs in their bird's nest, and then the mother bird sits there on top of the eggs, and the eggs get warm, and then suddenly they develop into baby birds, and the baby birds are out there chirping away. The other day I was in a place where they had a big cage with some birds in them, and they were... Um, I forget what they were. But anyhow, they were little birds, and they, were, they had like a little man-made basket, and all, th all three of them, mom, dad, and baby bird, were sitting in there looking outside, and it was really, really cute. But birds have nests because that's their home. Yeah. And we have, we have nests. Do you have a nest? Your nest? In your house? No, but your house is a nest. Did you know that? That's where you stay. That's where your family is. It doesn't look like a bird nest. Well, maybe somebody's house looks like a bird nest. I don't know. But you have a place where you go that you call home. And that's the place where we live and the place where we're with our friends and our parents and those who love us. Birds have nests. We have homes. This is our home here, too, for us, a special kind of family. Did you realize that, that this is a home? This is a home of God's people. Look at them all. God's people come here to worship and to praise God, and this is where we come. And in Psalm 84, some of you will hear me read today about a special home that a man saw, and he says the home where the birds even nest was in the temple. So we have a home here, a place where we are one family, and we're called Christians, a Christian family. So bird's nests are cool. I got a bunch of bird's nests sitting on a shelf somewhere that I picked them up. I don't know why I picked them up, but they're someplace in a barn or something now. And uh, they just sit there, and I don't know if I'll ever do anything with them. 
But birds' nests are cool because that's a home and a place where little birds are born. This is cool because this is a home and a place where our faith is born, where life is lived, and people of God come together. You want to pray with me? God, we thank you for our children in our church. We thank you for the presence of your spirit with them. And we ask as they grow stronger that we might be an influence in their lives and our church might make a difference for them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming out. You can stay. It's always a joyful thing to have the opportunity to welcome children into the church as part of the church. And today we have with us the Long family, Nick, uh, Nathan and uh, Margo. Uh, I did your wedding too, didn't I? Yeah. Gee. You know, it's cool when you get to travel with the family through their life. And he, uh, you're a full-time farmer still? Where are you farming now? Delaware County. They don't live here, but they wish they did. Yes. <laughs> they keep their tie with this church. And uh, we wish you did too. Any of you farmers got a job for a full-time farmer? <laughs> I mean, a really educated farmer. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. And so they bring their child to be baptized. And they were bringing children to Jesus that Jesus might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, Jesus was indignant. And he said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the realm of God. And truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the realm of God like a child shall not enter it. And Jesus took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. The sacrament of baptism is an outward and a visible sign of the grace of God. And inasmuch as the promise of the gospel is not only to us, but also to our children, Baptism with water and the Holy Spirit is the mark of their acceptance into the care of Christ's church and the sign and seal of their participation in God's forgiveness and the beginning of their growth into full Christian faith and discipleship. This is the water of baptism. And in this water, we have three drops of water from the River Jordan where Jesus was baptized. We have three for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But from the same river where Jesus was baptized came some of this water. And so this is the water of baptism, and out of this water we rise with new life, forgiven of sin and one in Christ, and members of Christ's body. I have some questions for you, Nathan and Margo. Do you desire to have your child baptized into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? If so, say we do. Will you encourage this child to renounce the powers of evil and receive the freedom of new life in Christ? If so, say we will with the help of God. Will you teach this child that she may be led to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Or is that he? It's a he. Yes. That he may be... <laughs> I, have a, I have a story about my first and second weddings I will tell you about sometime. <laughs> kind of like the same thing. Will you teach this child that she... He... <laughs> that he may be led to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior... If so, say, we will with the help of God. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciples yourselves, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and the word of Jesus Christ as best you are able? If so, say, we do with the help of God. Do you promise according to the grace given you to grow with this child in the Christian faith, to help this child to be a faithful member of the church of Jesus Christ by celebrating Christ's presence by furthering Christ's mission in all the world and by offering the nurture of the Christian church so that he may affirm his baptism. If so, say, we do with the help of God. Jesus Christ calls us to make disciples of all nations and to offer them the gift of grace and baptism. Do you who witness and celebrate this sacrament promise your love, support, and care to the one about to be baptized as he lives and grows in Christ? If so, say, we promised our love, support, and care. Love, support, and care. So let us unite with the church in all times and places in confessing our faith in the triune God. 
people of St. Paul's Church, do you believe in God? If so, say, I believe in God. I believe in God. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? If so, say, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? If so, say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And let us pray together. We thank you, God, for the gift of creation called forth by your saving word. Before the world had shape and form, your spirit moved over the waters and out of the waters of the deep. You formed a firmament and brought forth the earth to sustain all life. In the time of Noah, you washed the earth with the waters of the flood and your ark of salvation bore a new beginning. And in the time of Moses, your people Israel passed through the Red Sea waters from slavery to freedom and crossed the flowing Jordan to enter the promised land. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus Christ, who was nurtured in the water of Mary's womb. And then Jesus was baptized by John in the water of the Jordan, becoming living water to a woman at the Samaritan well, washed the feet of his disciples, and he sent them forth to baptize all the nations by water in the Holy Spirit. Blessed by your Holy Spirit, gracious God, this water. By your Holy Spirit, save those who confess the name of Jesus Christ, that sin may have no power over them. Create in this one baptized today day the joy and the wonder of serving Jesus Christ. And glory to you, eternal God, the one who was and is and shall always be, world without end. Amen. By what name do you call this lad? Mason Eugene Long. Mason Eugene Long. I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. You want to help? Okay. Cool. Oh, gracious God, we bring before you one of our children. We ask that you be with Mason all the days of his life as he grows stronger, as he grows taller, as he grows into manhood. And be with his parents so that they raise him in a way that he knows who you are and knows who your son is and what he has done for us. Bless him, we pray, and give him the strength to serve you well in the days ahead. Throughout the rest of his life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, there is Mason. Yeah. Did you get that? You can look at that picture 70 years from now and wonder who that old man is. You can come down. <laughs> okay. We have for you a rose that you can take with you. And here comes some baby stuff. Okay. Oh, Grandma wants one more. Okay. <laughs> we have to give allowance for that. And of course, here's the box. I don't know who gets the baby. Yeah, you can take the box later. You got him? Yeah. Got him. Okay, good. Go now and serve the Lord by raising your son in peace and love. <laughs> Already introduced to you is Craig Steenkamp, and I made him say that name over and over a couple times because I, I, you know, I wanted, I had this Steenkamp, Steenkamp but I got it right this time, Steenkamp. Now, Craig had a fancy title that you heard uh, Jeanette say, but the truth of the matter is, is he's the guy who knows how to build stuff. And he knows the right way to build stuff. And he knows what's the right material, how much it should weigh, how many yards, you know, square yards of it you'll need, where you're gonna put it, and how to put it there, and how to make it happen. And he turns, he can turn shacks into palaces. And that's what he does in Biloxi, Mississippi. He does that at our Back Bay Mission. And so he's going to be here, he's here today, and while he's here, we're gonna take advantage of him, just have him come for a couple minutes. He doesn't wanna preach, he just wants to tell you a thing or two and say thanks. That's what he told me. Craig, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, just like to say thank you for the invite up to beautiful weather, Ohio. Um, 
Back Bay Mission has been going for a very, very long time, uh, since 1922, I think, the leaflets in your bulletin. But over those years, it has uh, done many, many different programs. It's always kept a few core programs in it. Um, one of them uh, is emergency assistance, where they do um, utility help with utility bills and food pantry necessities. Um, another one is our Mike Day Center, where we help the, the local homeless population. Um, they can come in during the day, get showers, get clothes, use computers, do all that kind of stuff, where they can do everything that a home would call for other than just lay their head. The local governments there aren't allowed us, have not allowed us to build any shelters, so um, we can give them everything other than what they lay their head on in that market day center. Um, the housing recovery program, which I'm in charge of, is we do a lot of home, homework, home repairs, uh, building new construction, all that kind of thing, and I help direct volunteers like you all that have come down to help rebuild the Mississippi Coast uh, after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, our program has actually been running since 1969, since Hurricane Camille. Most people did not know that, uh, but it was a very basic program in the beginning, and Hurricane Camille uh, upped the ante on what we needed to do to serve the people on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And so we do all kinds of building down there, and most of the building that we do is rehabbing of homes, where we go out and help homeowners actually rehab their homes, typically elderly, low-income, disabled individuals or families. Um, our latest ventures have also been building homes for homeless veterans. Uh, what better population to serve than our veterans that have become homeless? And we've built uh, several units right now, and we're in the plans of uh, planning at uh, Homeport 3, which is uh, the veterans' homes. And all the volunteers that come down here help direct them and build all that stuff uh, to put a safe, decent uh, roof over people's heads and give them a home to live in. So we have many, many different programs I can go on all day long, but I would also like for you to uh, keep the people of the Mississippi Gulf Coast in your prayers for the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, which is coming up in a few days on the 29th. It has suffered over the years since Katrina. Uh, it continues to suffer, and people down there really need the, the prayers and support of, of the nation. Um, it suffered over not just Hurricane Katrina, but the economy, the oil spill, the floods that you had up in the Midwest normally come down the Mississippi River towards us. Um, but it continues to suffer, and it's, it's, uh, it needs all the prayers it, it can get. So we, we thank you for all the support that you continue to give us. We thank you for continuing to come down and support us down there as volunteers. Uh, there's nothing that makes the people of the Mississippi Gulf Coast uh, more hopeful than seeing your faces come down and continue to, to support them. Thank you very much.
The word of our Lord is taken from the 84th Psalm. And it says this. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and a swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God and Zion. O oh, Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O oh God of Jacob. Behold our shield, our God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. I'd like to take you just a moment to, to say something and add to what Craig said. Uh, it's a good experience to go there and to do this when we have a group that goes in February or March, uh, always from here, and uh, it's a good, good to go down there and, and build on these houses and work on these houses. And those of you that are folks who are watching us by television that aren't part of our church, you don't have to be part of our church to do this. Uh, you just have to have the desire to help. and. Uh, just call the church and we'll find a way to get you into a work camp if you are not aware of how to do that. But any of you, if you have the time, if you, have, you don't have to have talent. I mean, it took me down there, so. So you can do that and they'll be happy to have you come. The only thing would have been better, Becky, for that number is if we'd had Botticelli and Celine Dion here <laughs> singing it. And then you could have played for him and have been fantastic. We are all on a journey. Nearly 3,000 years ago, one man on a journey traveled to the temple in Jerusalem. And once there, he was struck by a truth that had never occurred to him before. And as he looked at the magnificence of the temple and he looked all around, he noticed, he noticed a mother swallow flying to her nest to find her young. She had made her home in the shelter of the great temple of Jerusalem. The traveler suddenly realized that he too had come home. He then wrote the psalm, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. The traveler made a journey ending in the realization that in the place where God's people gather is where we each are able to find that place called home. A new spiritual awakening has been happening in our time. For a while in the last century, there were those saying the faith was going to be a dead issue. And it still is a question. Then there were those speaking to the idea that the world was now living in the post-Christian era, meaning a time where Christianity has no longer any true influence. 
Christianity, however, continues to thrive in our world. In places like Africa and Asia, the faith has taken on greater meaning. In Europe, which seemed to divest itself of the Christian faith, a renewed interest is developing there. In the United States, the times are being dubbed the post-denominational era. There's interest in faith, there's interest in spirituality, but they're calling it the post-denominational area for that to which I'll speak a little later. Whatever you call it, though, people are asking more and more questions about of a spiritual nature, about the spiritual life. And the bottom line, though, is that all of those asking the questions are hunting for a place where they may become spiritually at home. Because that is true, we need to prepare ourselves, we need to prepare our congregation, we need to prepare our church in general to be a place where, as with the traveler who wrote Psalm 84, where people can realize that even the swallow has a home at God's altar. We need to build our mission, we need to build our vision, we need to build our programming, our worship, all in ways that make the wanderer, that makes the weary or the spiritually impoverished person so inspired that when she or he is among us, that person would want to proclaim, my soul longs indeed fades for the courts of the Lord. Therefore, this church, St. Paul's, with these people will be my home. That doesn't happen, however, by simply saying so be it or buying a preacher. It takes willingness. It takes preparation and prayer to accomplish such, th such things. Above all else, it takes understanding what the church is really about. What then are some of the things that are considered key to understanding this church's role in the new spiritual awakening? First, God's house is lovely because it is open. That was what was cool about the temple. It was open. That's how the swallow could fly in and fly out and all that. God's house is lovely because it is open. So open that even the swallow finds a home. No one is excluded from being in God's presence. What we don't seem to realize is that our God is an inclusive God. God created everybody that walks the face of this earth. So if you've got a problem with somebody who walks the face of this earth, you've got a problem with God. God made them. God made everybody. So no one's excluded from being in God's presence because God is inclusive. How can that be said? Well, the scripture teaches that God is no respecter of persons. That does not mean that God has no respect for us. It means that in God's eyes, there is no one group of people who have certain entitlements above and beyond any other group. There is no individual better nor any individual worse than anyone else in God's eyes. Maybe in yours, but not in the one who created you. Not in his eyes. How God sees things is not the challenge, though. The challenge is found in confronting the prejudice that can be found among us. Prejudice thrives among those who are afraid of their own incompleteness. This is what prejudice is about. It thrives among those who are afraid of their own incompleteness, who are afraid of their own inadequacy, who are afraid of their own shortfalls. And so it is much easier for them who have that kind of prejudice to suppress and marginalize someone else in an effort to feel good about themselves. You don't, however, make yourself a better person by hurting other people or suppressing other people. If anything, one degrades himself or herself, becoming someone of questionable integrity as a result of doing that and becoming someone who in God's eyes is perhaps a little marginal. If I'm going to be looking at things as God sees it, I need to understand that though other people may be different, from me, it does not mean that God loves me more. Just because somebody else isn't like Ed Bray, you know, I could say, I could look at all of you and say, I'm Ed Bray, 
God loves me more because of who I am, more than you. And what would you think of that? You think, you arrogant son of a... Yeah. And that's how you would feel. So if I'm going to be looking at things as God sees it, I need to understand that though other people may be different from me, it does not mean that God loves me more. Certainly God wants us all to think well of ourselves, but not at the expense of other people. So God is, whether you like it or not, inclusive. If you don't like it, take it up with God. Another issue, key to understanding the role the church can play in the, this modern spiritual awakening is to understand that basically people do not care what the name of the church is or of what de denomination it is anymore. They don't care. The unchurched person, the one that we call nuns, N-O-N-E-S's, nuns, the unchurched person cares mostly about what is going on in the life of a specific local congregation. We are living today in what many now term the post-denominational era, as I said. And that is why there are so many independent churches of all stripes and colors that are thriving in America. They are born out of a basic mistrust that currently exists of any so-called brand name church. And so churches pull out of their denomination because they mistrust them. Not because they're theologically incorrect or correct. They mistrust. And that mistrust, however, can unfortunately be born, therefore, beliefs in theology that are not really representative of Jesus' teachings. You go among the different independent churches and check out what they're preaching. Sometimes it just doesn't sound like Jesus. So, in that mistrust, sometimes churches move way away from what Christ was teaching. And what results is division among the very people who believe themselves to be Christian. And it just gets worse. Today, many denominations are working together across traditional lines to serve the cause of Christ. For example, the Reformed Church of America, meaning the Presbyterian Church, the Evangelical Lutherans, and the United Church of Christ, all those churches are all in full communion with one another. We can have our clergy serve the separate churches. I can serve as a Lutheran pastor, or I can serve as a Presbyterian pastor, Disciples of Christ is also a partner church, I can go there. Even our baptism recently became acceptable by the Roman Catholic Church in North America because I baptize a child in the name of a Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, the same formula. And so, if any of you want to convert to Catholicism, you can transfer your membership now without having to be rebaptized. You could do it the other way all the time. <laughs> we were okay with it for centuries. All of what I just said is significant because it is God's intention that we all be one in Christ. Our Savior even prayed to the Father saying, Holy Father, keep them in thy name, the name which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. John 17. So division between the churches that follow Jesus does not make sense. God does not recognize denominational lines, nor does God value congregations being independent from other churches. Just as God is inclusive of all people, God is inclusive of all churches, and through Jesus Christ has directed us all to become one in God's name. That's even on the United Church of Christ flag, it says, that they all may be one. Jesus has directed us to become one in God's name. God is ecumenical, and therefore God wants all churches to be united. There's a need for us to understand just why you and I come to this holy house in the first place, why we believe other people should come here too. You do believe that, don't you? You do believe other people should be sitting in these pews, don't you? You should, and you should want them to. You should invite them. Why we believe other people should be here is important. And then why we need to be open to receiving whomever God sends into our midst is important, whether they're like us or not. In an Alban Institute article 
the author wrote that we need to remind ourselves that the business of the Christian church is, quote, to help people experience God and live the gospel message of life and hope. That's what the church is about. I believe that we are all in this holy place at this very moment in time because we are all on a journey. Everyone in this room is on a journey. Sometimes our journeys crisscross each other, you know, like a man and woman get married and they travel together down the road and then, then one dies and one goes on, like I've experienced. Sometimes friends come into our lives and they're our friends for a season and then things just kind of make you go apart. We all journey and our journeys collide and our journeys coexist at times. And we're all on that same journey together. And in this holy place, so are we too on a spiritual journey. Like the traveling psalmist, our souls long and indeed faint for the courts of the Lord. We are on this pilgrimage every Sunday morning when we come into this house of worship. Here we are refreshed and renewed. Here we are strengthened to go back out into the world and to do life all over again. It's here that our minds can jump out of our pockets. Where so many people like to keep their minds, you know. Put it away so nobody knows what's going on in my brain. Our minds in the church can jump out of the pockets and can ask questions and our spirits can be set free. We are here because we believe our destiny, we believe our eternity lies in God. Our life is a journey that began in our mother's wombs, as you heard me read in the baptism, and continues far on out even beyond what is our earthly graves. And we all one day will have one. There's not one person in this room who's not going to die. Throughout our journey, just as that ancient temple of God was home to the sparrow and the swallow, so too Christ's church is meant to be the home to all of God's children. For God, there are no distinctions of class. For God, there are no distinctions of race. For God, there are no distinctions of economies. God is inclusive. For God, there is no church's name more important than the other. God is ecumenical. Here we are to be at home with God. And as the psalmist wrote, happy are those who live in your home, ever singing your praise. Welcome home, my friend. Welcome to God's house with God's people. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, we seek to be more the people of God that we should be, and we seek to be closer to you. Help us to continue to grow in our faith. Help us to be more the church in the world. We know you've blessed this church with a lot of talent and resources and abilities, and we use them, and we keep wanting to use them to glorify you. Bless now the work of this church. Bless its people who are in it. Bless all of our missions that we serve. Be close to them and help them to be strong and able in the face of the difficulties they have. Bless the people who are serving our country in the military. Bless the people who are in our families whom we love. Bless the people who are friends and neighbors in this town. Bless the churches all over this town and their pastors. And help us to be truly a faithful and a faith-filled people. For we pray that in the name of Jesus who taught his disciples that we may pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
what you have the privilege of doing along with me is serving God through giving of our tithes, our offerings, our sacrifices. We bring them to this place because we're capable of doing that. Not everybody in the world is really capable as we are. But what we give does make a difference in the world. And just as Craig stood up here and represented one organization that we help, there are many others that we help. And we do lots of things with the money that we give here. We do lots of things that make a difference. And so by your gift, whether it's large or whether you consider it to be small, is immaterial. It's a gift to God's work. And it'll be a blessing to God and a blessing to you. With gratitude in our hearts, God, we look to you with these gifts of our time, our talent, and our treasure, and we seek your blessing on each of them. Help us to share what we have with you and with the world in ways that glorify your name. Be with this church and our consistory as we make decisions about how we will serve you with the time and talent and treasures that we have. 
And help us to know, God, that what we're doing blesses you and makes you feel good about us. We pray that in Jesus' name with thanksgiving in our hearts. Amen. It is an amazing grace that God would forgive a sinner like me. And you all can say that too. It's an amazing grace. And it's by that amazing grace that we are called to go out into the world and to live our lives. Not to shelter ourselves in this place. For you see, this place is open to the sparrow and the swallow. Fly freely in and out. Once in a while we've had a bat. But the point is that the world waits for you people who have faith and an openness to a world that is in jeopardy and needs that faith to be brought to it. And you bring it to that world by living it, by talking about it, by feeling confident in it and recognizing who you are and to whom it is you belong. No matter how shallow you feel you are, no matter how lacking you think you might be, all God asks you to do is to make yourself available to serve God. And God makes you able. So when you walk from this place, allow God to make you able to do great things just in your life. And you will have helped to change this world. Go now, my friends, and serve God in peace. And one day, the God of all mercy and love will make his face to shine on you and grant you eternal peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.